Thank you, Kevin. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country on which we're gathered today. As Kevin mentioned in the productive landscape theme, I want to talk to you about the project uh, that I'm leading. It uh, has three dimensions to it, climate change adaptation, energy futures and the carbon economy. I want to talk to you about the scope, the context that frames our work and just some of the preliminary findings we've come up with to date. Broadly, three broad key research questions, one for each of our three dimensions. Uh, firstly, what are the feasible options for adaptation to climate change? It's about emphasis on the word feasible. So there's a social, economic, a pragmatic and a policy dimension to making that adaptation effective and workable. And the second word in, uh, I want to draw your attention to in that first question is about enhancing livelihoods. So we want to go beyond just climate change adaptation that allows us to cope with our current uh, settlements, businesses, but one that actually, adaptation that allows us to enhance current livability. The second research question is about uh, energy futures, which is shorthand for looking at ways to increase our efficient use of current energy sources, but also exploring what renewable sources are out there. Technically feasible, but also socially acceptable. And the third research question relates to the very dynamic and fast moving space of the carbon economy. Our geographical focus is northern and central Australia for this work. I've just got a, some, a collection of images from some of our field work which I'll relate to in more detail. As Kevin mentioned, a systems approach. For us that works really well for thinking about the integrated nature of those three themes climate adaptation, energy futures, the carbon economy, but bringing it together in a package that recognises the complexity and integrated nature of people's lives and businesses. Just to illustrate that systems approach, I just want to walk you through the, uh, the text around the outside of the three themes. Climate change impacts for northern central Australia, it's hot and projected to get much hotter over the next uh, part of this century. That, if you like, translates to more intensive heat waves, which affects community health, and that in turn affects worker productivity for those industries in these productive landscapes. Second point there, it also leads to increasing costs for us to cope or enhance our livability. So increased costs are expected for keeping us cool, but also the operating costs for our businesses in these landscapes. Much coming to light about the economic and social impacts of extreme weather events. I'll talk, give some examples and dimensions to that in a moment. But also it relates through to the climate change adaptation with why are we continuing to repair infrastructure that's been damaged by extreme weather events? How should we invest in that? Who should be the co-investors? And what are the standards we need that take account of projected climate change? Already we're seeing changes in workforce uh, practices, particularly for those industries that are reliant on, uh, have a sizeable component of outdoor work. We're also seeing that changing on the sporting field. Who would have thought that Kerry Packer would have been at the vanguard of climate change adaptation by switching cricket to night games. I'm not sure that was his original intent, but <coughs> it, what's that, Paul? And the six ball over. Exactly. A really good illustration of sensible adaptation for my mind. Secondly, it's about investing in more robust infrastructure, both at a household level, but at a broader uh, business sector as well. And lastly, energy efficiency, water efficiency is going to be critical, but also the exploration of renewable energy sources. 
I just want to give you some illustration of the impacts, the costs, the scale of projected climate change impacts on central Australia. We're expecting hotter conditions, as I mentioned, uh, leading to increased heat stress. Some terrific work documented by um, members of the Climate Commission have come up with this really sobering, horrifying statistic that perhaps by the end of the century there's going to be ten times as many heat-related deaths in Queensland and Northern Territory. We're expecting that there'll be increased sickness and hospital admissions and the associated lost days at work, so a direct impact on the economy, but also schools, so again a direct impact on education. Already healthcare services are estimated to be about $5,000 per person at the moment, projected to nearly double by 2050, less than 40 years' time. Also, we're seeing the compounding nature of uh, the impacts of climate change on health services, the delivery of health services. Particularly when we're getting extreme weather events, not only do we get increased demand for health support and service, uh, but at that very time we're likely to see that infrastructure, those services, negatively impacted as well. So if you like, we're getting a, a magnifying or intensifying impact of severe weather events. <clears throat> the impacts on the productivity of the agricultural industries in central and northern Australia is Pro Professor Garno a few years ago uh, did some economic modelling. He projected that 20% decline in agricultural productivity by the end of this century. Again, most of that decline is going to be concentrated in central and northern Australia. So the very work that Andy and Sally have been talking about really comes into sharp relief for me in terms of, well, how do we think through what adaptation might be sensible, affordable and feasible? The costs for, I've mentioned, increased cooling as conditions heat up. That's going to be at a household level. It's going to be affected and felt at the business level as well. Maintaining roads and other infrastructure expected reasonably enough to increase. Again, to give you an illustration of uh, the scale and cost of that impact, in Queensland, the 2010-11 summer floods closed and restricted 40 out of 50 coal mines in Queensland. People have recently calculated that to be a cost of two to five billion dollars from that collection of severe weather uh, costing the coal mining industry in that part of Australia. I just want to show you uh, a couple of images there of how variable the climate can be in central Australia. The slide on the left is peak hour at a well-known river crossing in Alice Springs. The second slide, peak flow, as I called it. Uh, it was amazing how it paralysed the city of Alice Springs for about half an hour. <laughs> I just want to move on to the exposure with, that's modelled by colleagues, not ourselves, but uh, there's, as you may be aware, there's several models you can use to uh, project climate change or changes in temperature. Again, here, modelling for central Australia. Uh, based on work by a colleague of mine, Jane Adamson, has done recently for us, and that is that by 2030 we're expecting, or the projections are, that there will be a one, zero to two degree increase in both the summer and winter time temperature. Not too bad, particularly sitting in Canberra on days like this, but when we go forward to 2100, some projections, not all, but some projections are showing increases of five to seven degrees in both summer and winter. That's leading to conditions in Alice Springs by towards the end of the century that well over six months of the year, it's going to be over 35 degrees daytime temperature. Pretty sobering. 
for someone like myself who's just moved there from colder climes. But you can see it's not just Central Australia, there's some coastal and other um, Queensland locations as well, uh, Western Australia. A dramatic increase, particularly towards the latter half of this century, in heat expected. And to borrow some of the wordage from the Productivity Commission, they were very clear in their recent report that we need to be thinking about this, but going further, we need to be adapting to changing climatic conditions. I want to give you some of the emerging results from our work and I want to focus firstly on the Northern Australian beef cattle industry. Its value at the moment is estimated to be about $5 billion. And you remember that figure before from Professor Garno's calculation I mentioned that 20% decline in the agricultural industries by the end of this century. Most of that decline concentrated in this northern central Australian beef cattle industry. We've got some really hard thinking to do there. $5 billion worth of value at the moment, uh, 8,000 odd producers in this sector. Really sensitive to increasing uh, rainfall variability with impacts on forage availability and forage quality. And that's already stimulating landholders, graziers, to start thinking about well, what are the adaptation options within their sector that they can start to explore with, such as stand and graze options or some irrigated mosaic farming options are being explored at the moment. The increasing extreme weather is going to make challenging for herd management, challenges for herd management, I should say. You're going, if you like, from being understocked one month of the year to being heavily overstocked a couple of months later. Really challenging for uh, business managers, but it also has environmental management implications as well when we're going from one extreme to the other. Access to markets increasingly expected to be affected by extreme weather events such as flooding of our roads. A recent agreement by COAG is that they're uh, they've agreed to invest $10 billion in transport infrastructure in Queensland, Northern Territory, WA, as a way, as one response to adapting to more challenging climatic conditions. We know the electricity and fuel costs are already rising and they're going to continue to rise and directly affect the operations of these businesses. This is where that energy futures space comes into play, looking at efficiencies, but renewable alternatives as well. Having said all that, we've found very few practical tools for producers in terms of thinking through and analysing how they should adapt to climate variability and climate change. That's something we want to contribute to directly. I want to move on to transport futures work led by uh, Bruno Spandenade, who's uh, with the Centre for Appropriate Technology. He's working full time with us on this work. I just want to illustrate the graphic disparity between remote and urban transport conditions, if you like. Just some of the data there, you can see contrasting figures in safety, in uh, costs of operation, in household incomes and the proportion the transport occupies. Much more expensive for remote families and they're paying higher fuel prices. Bruno's documented work that indicates that people living in remote Australia are far more dependent on private vehicles. Again, so that restricts the feasible alternatives. Yet they face higher costs and more dangerous uh, driving conditions. We're trying to explore what's affordable, what's desirable alternatives in this space. I just want to illustrate the challenging driving conditions with that image there. This is a, a shot after Bruno and I did some field work. Um, car not in good repair at all. I want to assure you, Jan, no, there is no evidence that this was a Ninty One vehicle. <laughs> I was only joking. <coughs> I want to move on to the energy futures 
part, and Lisa Havis at Charles Darwin University is leading our work in this area. And this program has recently uh, concluded, but fascinating work that we're still working with the Alice Springs Council and other partners in this initiative, analysing the data, really mining the lessons there and looking at how we can translate lessons to other parts of Australia, particularly remote northern Australia. The Alice Solar City initiative achieved up to a 30% participation amongst domestic householders in this program, which is, stands head and shoulders amongst other renewable energy initiatives around Australia. Uh, the different lines there, I just want to explain. The blue was about people that signed up, expressed interest in some form of participation in the initiative. The red zone indicates the aggregate number of households that undertook an energy audit by someone coming in skilled to appraise their full household uh, energy budget and provide advice on strategies to adopt. The large green zone is householders that went on and co-invested in physical changes or technology to change their uh, energy sources. Really impressive um, by national standards. Now there's many layers of data that we've come up with behind the, the two graphs I'm showing you here today, but what's really important is that household income has not been a good predictor of household behaviour in terms of adoption of renewable energy technology. That's a little bit counterintuitive in challenging some of the more uh, the prevailing conventional wisdom about who will adopt and to the extent that they will adopt renewable energy in Australia. The blue graph is indicating that people, uh, households with a fifty to $100,000 per annum household income uh, were the highest adopters of PVs, photovoltaic uh, panels for electricity generation. And as the income, household income increased, we didn't get a, an appreciable corresponding increase in adoption. Puzzling at first. Behind that, we're finding that that middle income group was actually a sweet spot where they had enough disposable household income to co-invest in technology, but they are also particularly price sensitive to energy costs of running their household. That second graph, just briefly, fascinating work that Lisa's prepared for us is that we found no rebound effect from people who adopted PV panels. Interesting because that was, has been uh, talked about at some length both in Australian literature and internationally that people that adopt uh, PV panels might simply just increase their energy usage uh, with extra appliances. We found in the Alice Springs case that by tracking households before adoption and afterwards for a couple of years found no increase in overall energy use. So these households were uh, generating, now generating, about a third of their power use, sorry, power needs from PVs. That is a 30% direct reduction in energy costs. So it's money saved. <clears throat> I must say, sorry, just before I move on, that there's a terrific afterglow we've detected once this program finished in uh, the middle of this year. And that's been picked up by SMEs, small, medium enterprises around Alice Springs that are continuing to meet the generated or stimulated demand for PVs and other uh, renewable energy technology in Central Australia. So to me, that's a terrific uh, outcome. I want to move briefly just to this last point, the co-benefits or exploring how we might achieve co-benefits in the carbon economy. Dr Cathy Robinson from CSIRO is leading our work in this area and there's some particular relevant points I, I just want to let you know about in terms of Central Australia. Conventionally the carbon economy is going to be concentrated where there's high levels of bioactivity. We're exploring the concept of co-benefits where we want to get cultural benefits from as well as or linked to carbon benefits. 
in a way, this is about stretching the demand for the carbon economy, increasing the scale and scope for participation, particularly in people in mid to low rainfall areas, to be engaged in the carbon economy. This is, at the moment, very conceptual work, uh, but we're really excited by the opportunities there. Maybe a bit counterintuitive in that the carbon price is incredibly low in looking at the European index, but we think that that's going to suit us in that it's going to force people to think beyond just the cash income of how to make carbon, biodiversity, landscape changes that also add value to cultural values in remote Australia. We think there's an interesting space opening up. Just to help round off the key messages from our work to date, we know that the impacts or combination of issues associated with climate, uh, extreme weather and energy, particularly energy prices for conventional supplies going up, is already a major driver of change in remote central and northern Australia. We've got to be more precise and detailed in our understanding about which sectors, which members of which communities are going to be most effective and what becomes a feasible pathway to change for those people. We're expecting a high degree of variation. The second point there about conventional adaptation we know is energy and water intensive uh, or hungry in central and northern Australia. That's going to increase. So that's why we've got this focus on improving energy efficiency and water efficiency, but also exploring alternatives, not just to cope, but to enhance livability, really important for us. The third point about the co-benefits of capturing carbon, as well as cultural benefits from our remote landscapes, we think that that's going to be transformational change or opportunities for some communities, some people, and businesses in future. Some of the key principles for improving the adaptive capacity of people, communities and businesses, just three I've listed there, have a no regrets approach. So what would, should we invest in, whether we get the projected climate change impacts or not, that are going to leave us better off? What changes or adaptation options are going to be flexible? have a degree of softness around the edge and investing in both hard and soft infrastructure or opportunities is likely to be critical. I suppose as an aside that our team has detected a shift in the narrative for remote Australia where initially people spent a lot of time talking to us about challenges and obstacles of climate change adaptation energy futures, the carbon economy. That's now shifted in the last couple of months where people really pleased and enthusiastic to engage in conversations about opportunities and what those feasible pathways may be. If you like, we're moving from a perfect storm where these compounding issues of negativity are giving way to a sweet spot where people are starting to detect pathways for positive change. I just want to acknowledge a really wonderful, diverse, uh, multidisciplinary team we've got behind us for this project and their many organisations which, typical in the CRC structure, allows us to leverage and scale up uh, and benefit from the networks of those individual organisations and partners. I'll leave it there. Thank you.